Live from San Jose, California, in the heart of Silicon Valley, it's theCUBE. Covering Hadoop Summit 2016, brought to you by Hortonworks. Now, here are your hosts, John Furrier and George Gilbert. Hey, welcome back everyone. We are live in Silicon Valley for Silicon Angles, the Cube. It's our flagship program. We go out to the events and extract the signal from the noise. I'm John Furrier with my co-host, George Gilbert. Our next guest is Jock Istock, who's the Data Engineering of America's Pivotal. Welcome to the Cube. Thank you for having me. So, um, Pivotal, modern applications. You guys really, I mean, from all indications, there's a line around the corner to work with Pivotal. Because you guys have essentially been doing Agile really before Agile was Agile. That is correct. Uh, but there's some really interesting things happening with uh, DevOps going mainstream. Mm -hmm. This modernization with Docker containers allows for rapid acceleration of value creation in the app developer space. Correct. Which is one of your core competencies. With cloud, it's the perfect storm. So can you share for a minute just how that ties together from a pivotal perspective and what that means from a customer. As they look at the, at the excitement, their eyes are popping out there, and they, but they see the complexity and they go, where do I start? So, so back in 2013 when we formed Pivotal, we really put together this trifecta, as you said. So Agile, DevOps was clearly um, going to be the mainstay. Everyone was coming through and nobody could do it better than Pivotal Labs. And then in order to really iterate, we, um, we have a Pivotal Cloud Foundry, which is based off of the open source Cloud Foundry. And that allows us to have a platform as a service to deploy those apps in and then Google-ish, Facebook scale, but for the enterprise. And then what powers all of those apps, putting it all all together is that perfect trifecta of big data or data in general. And so, you know, out of our portfolio, we have you know three main data products: our Greenplum database, our Gemfire uh, data grid, and then our uh, HDB database, which is uh, based off the Apache Hawk version. And that allows us actually to have really the the every piece that uh, enterprises are looking for today in order to modernize where they've been for the last 20 years, moving to the future. What are some of the table stakes for an enterprise that wants to accelerate that front end, kind of drive some business value top line, not just cost cutting, really the innovation strategy. What are some of the table stakes that they need to have in place today? So, to, be, to go down that road. So I would say the first thing you really need is a change agent. Um, so time and time again, without somebody who's really willing to put their neck on the line and actually change the organization, it becomes very difficult to, to do. We tend to take a very iterative approach. So we try to um, introduce ourselves in either a pocket, uh, a couple applications that need to be refactored, a couple new applications, uh, a certain data platform that needs to be sped up or perhaps modernized uh, or perhaps extended upon, uh, but in an open way. I think th you'll agree with me that the, the world has moved on beyond uh, just having a proprietary system that they buy into. They really want to have an open platform that they can rely on, you know, that's going to be there for the long haul and the longevity. Once you have that, uh, a lot of it has to do with process. So, you know, I, I think a lot of organizations have put together a process that is uh, mirrored in legacy, and that legacy needs to change as well. In you order mean waterfall. Waterfall, but, I know, but, but waterfall's one, you know, yeah. clearly and I want to say process even outside of you know your classic application development but process in general so you know there are folks when I go to an organization that that my when I leave I think their whole job is really to say no we don't we, we can't do that um, so so we need that process to change so that they can actually compete in today's market and you see it time and time again where organizations are looking around and seeing their markets disrupt in a case like Uber. what's the change there is it it's, it's shadow IT is the fact that the person who said no no longer has the power to stop a good idea? Is it, the, is it because I can stand up uh, an app and say, here's a prototype? Or is it just more um, business value? So, so I was just going to say, the, the word that comes to mind for me is success. So when the business sees success, success begets success. And so, so I, I, I think yeah. you see it time and time again. So start again. small, pick a small project, get for going sure, that way. For sure, And then it just blossoms. And, and I'll say the other thing that, you know, to your original question, I think what happens is in an organization there's a lot of uh, caution. And, uh, you know, if you look at a developer, you look at a DBA or a system administrator, what they want to do is is they want to see their the fruits of their labor actually be used and, and drive value. That's that's what they actually want. And so when they see somebody having success in a small spot, they want to be there too. And so I, I continue, it just snowballs. 
What was the uh, data angle for you guys? Because one of the things I want to get drilled into is how do you talk to customers about the valuation of data? Because now you got IoT coming down the pike, you got all these new processes coming in, unknowns coming in. You got to be kind of set up, not to foreclose the future. You want to take advantage. So is that an architectural challenge? Is it just in general concepts? How do you guys talk about that development phenomenon? So, so I think we we start with you got to have the right architecture uh, before you can do anything else. Otherwise, you know, all the data that you have, uh, you won't be able to actually leverage. I think uh, what organizations have been doing for the last five, you know, five or six years as they've explored uh, the Hadoop ecosystem is they've really seen that, wow, we've got a lot of data here. Let me see if I can make use of it. You know, I think the, the, the progressions in the technology, so Hadoop, I think you'll agree, has, has matured you know, almost more rapidly than any other technology that I've seen you know, in the last 15 years. And so that ability to become enterprise ready has really enabled more uh, uh, folks to, to actually leverage it. But you, know, you, you extend that just a, a little bit farther. You know, I think the, uh, there is that caution, the general caution in, in the marketplace. And what we found, and, and the way Pivotal has changed and migrated over the last couple of years, is where we bring the most value is enabling our customers to actually take advantage of that scale and advantage of that technology. So we created HDB, which is based off of Apache Hawk, uh, which is an open source database platform, fully ANSI SQL compliant, that runs on top of uh, an ODBI distribution like, like HDB from Horton. So now that you have this platform in place, the, the methodology, the platform as a service, the core data management um, services, what are some of the most, what are the real showcase applications, you know, both in terms of application sophistication and, and scale that you point others to? So, so I think, you know, uh, I mean, it's funny, there are, there are two places to look there. One would be, once you have all of that, and once you have it in place in a, a scalable and easy to manage platform, uh, you have the ability to iterate more rapidly. And, and not only more rapidly, but also, uh, you know, again, kind of in small uh, notions, so that, uh, um, circular event of having an application, watching people use it, interacting with other users, your backend systems, other data, leveraging you know analytics and data science to really predict instead of react, and then uh, change the application to take advantage of those. So one such uh, idea would be you know the the uh, idea of not taking your first offer but taking your next best offer. And so you know we we work with a couple of our customers where you know we try to upsell folks, the first time that you uh, present an offer may not be the one that you actually choose, but being able to individually target folks based on their patterns and their techniques, which again, we can only really do now with the plethora of CPU and storage and, and, and technologies that you see out here. Uh, once you're able to do that, it becomes a very personal experience for, for our customers and their customers. What do you see as um, the the role of data vis-a-vis -vis data warehouses and real time, because real time is one of those things everyone wants now, sure. and it has to be embedded in the fabric of, of the application. Yet the application developers, like they used to deal with infrastructure, move to DevOps. Mm -hmm. Is there a data ops kind of role going on where I just want to have access to all this free data and not have to worry about schemas and structures? And is there a DevOps phenomenon out there coming that developers would just be dealing with data in a, easy way. So, so you hit the nail on the head, and, and we're seeing this with a, a lot of our customers now that are, are actually waking up and saying, you know, I, I live in uh, the database team in the data warehousing environment, and what I've realized is that as data comes through my purview, you know, it takes so long for me to model it and integrate it in with everything that by the time I can provide business value, you know, the, the business value is, is a year, 18 months, you know, down the line. So the ability to actually land the data and let business users take advantage of it right away while still maintaining, so, so I, I will argue that the, the EDW is not dead. Um, the EDW will, will, live, will live on, but what Hadoop and what technology. They're not mutually exclusive. You can have the data lake and have stuff stored. Exactly. That's resting data. That is correct. And, and then you have you know, very purpose built, and, and this actually fits in very nicely with our, uh, our data microservice um, architecture and, and, and kind of thought process, which is you know, let's make purpose built, small, uh, uh, 
I'll say singleton use, uh, use applications. Data containers? Data containers, I like that. <laughs> I may take that. <laughs> <In> the <dock. laughs> I'll be right on the cube, open source. <laughs> now feel free. Just no, but, but, but taking Creative those Commons, and, and, and <laughs> actually you know, being able to leverage that. Uh, loyalty's coming, royalty's coming. Um, no, but this is the concept, this is the idea of making things frictionless in this mind of a developer. Right, exactly. <laughs> you know, and, and I think, you know, I'll, I'll go back to what I said before, you know, I, I think over the last 20 to 30 years, uh, we have siloed not only IT from the business, but also within IT, we've siloed individual groups by themselves. And all that's done is, is caused roadblocks to get things done. And, and I think, you know, one of the nice things about a lot of these uh, other infrastructure as a service players, like Amazon, like Microsoft, who are coming in, what they're doing is actually showing the rest of the business that it doesn't have to be hard. It actually can be relatively simple. And so what I'm seeing is customers are looking for a path to make that Amazonian experience uh, enabled in not only their data center, but also within Amazon. And I think our products actually allow you to cross uh, both sides. Do you need to change, or are you getting pressure from customers to add more and more services to you know, Pivotal Cloud Foundry so that you can take the richness, the choice, the richness of choice from Amazon, but the um, local control that you might have with you know local cloud foundry, on-prem cloud foundry. So, so, so I would say, um, in a way, we are seeing our customers uh, push for and and really need more data services within cloud foundry, and we're very focused on on the pivotal data side in order to enable that and partner with many of the folks you see back here. Um, I think that what they're really saying though is help me get out of the business of managing things that I don't need to manage and help me make use of all the data by uh, uh, by operational excellence, uh, by uh, being able to scale. Uh, you know, one of the things that we've taken in an iterative approach is, is uh, Pivotal started on the data side a, a, a managed service so that uh, customers can stop leveraging and, and having to, to scale up their own internal uh, folks to be able to manage these data products, but instead can actually make use of those products. So I think what you'll see is more and more of a convergence of ease of use, ease of operations, again, so that customers and businesses can just make use of that underlying technology. Have you ever tried benchmarking the cost of operation of services hosted on Pivotal Cloud Foundry relative to Amazon or Azure? So, I know you run on, on one or both of those, but you know, like a private cloud um, cost of ownership versus. Sure, so, so I think, um, so yes, so we have bench, but we have uh, done ROI calculations around that. Yeah. I think you know what I would what I would say here is there is a, a barrier of entry to Amazon. There's a barrier of entry to uh, your own cloud infrastructure. But what what is probably more indicative of, of our value prop is the barrier of exit. So by leveraging something like Cloud Foundry, it's there is no barrier. Motel, of exit. easy to get in. <laughs> yes, hard exactly. to get out. Exactly. So I got to ask for the clouds since you brought that up. I mean, this is the dynamic architecturally and or business logic policy policy-wise is the relationship between data and the cloud. Your thoughts on this and conversations you're involved with, with uh, engineering teams and customers. For sure, so so I think, uh, again, the cloud is really changing the dynamic for a lot of organizations, as, as I'm sure you guys have seen. Um, storage, which was uh, one of our parents' you know, mainstays, uh, has become you know, quite commoditized over time. And, and I think you know, there exists a spot now, uh, more so than ever, where uh, uh, customers and, and organizations are amenable to leveraging the cloud for data storage. So as of today, what I would tell you is all data that originates in the cloud, most customers are fine and want to keep it in the cloud. It makes a complete uh, bunch of sense there. All data that's uh, originated internally will more or less stay internally unless they can start to leverage pieces of the cloud in order to do scale, uh, scale and, and elasticity uh, kind of applications and, and uh, uh, analysis. So, so, but that uh, gravitas towards, again, you know, I think businesses are not in the business of making IT.
IT organizations, but really in the business of their business. And so if they can leverage um, somebody else's infrastructure, they are going to do that. We are now in a spot where most of these companies have made big, big investments over the, you know, the course of the last 20 years that will continue probably for the course of the next 20 years. Data centers they've acquired or servers that they've purchased, that those need to be depreciated over time. But I think what you'll see is, is a bigger and bigger push towards uh, a lot of these other players, again, so that they can really focus on their business. Jacques, thanks for sharing the data on theCUBE. Really appreciate it. Final question I want to ask you to end the segment is, the career path for data engineering is not well plowed. You're pioneering a lot of this, and it really truly is cutting edge science now and role. That's correct. You know, so what is just, what is data engineering, and what does that mean for prospective students, hires, people looking to get a career in data engineering? So, so, so to me, data engineering is near and dear to my heart. It has meant many things over the last 20 years. Uh, today, as a, as a data engineer slash data wrangler, I think what we're teaching people is uh, the ability to, there is no right tool for the job. Or sorry, so there's no one tool for the job. There is a right tool for the job. And things like Hadoop. But don't be a one tool for the job, the hammer, but everything's a nail. That is correct. Literally, so, metaphorically, don't be the one tool for the job. <laughs> <laughs> but, but as, it, but as yeah. it evolves, so you can leverage all of these tools, and what they do is um, uh, negate your ability or your necessity to have to be the, uh, the, the wrench turner who's just moving data from A to B but instead you know, gravitate towards more of that analyst statistician who's actually uh, you know, going through and, and finding nuggets of information within the data. So a data engineer to me is, is everything. It is you know, somebody who's, who's looking at the data, who is actually um, you know, making sense of the data, but also overall architecture, because even uh, today, even with all of these wonderful uh, software technologies, without a proper data architecture it's to an support engineering position. the application. It's that, an engineering position. That is correct. Yeah. Like they say in baseball, multi-tool player. You have multiple <laughs> tools for the job. Shock, thanks so much for sharing the data and insights to engineering it all here at Hadoop Summit 2016. I'm John Furrier, George Gilbert, you're watching theCUBE, we'll be right back.